Hi, good morning. How are you? Today is Wednesday, uh, May 24th, and we are continuing our discussions right here on discoveringourcosmicself.com. The questions are taken from uh, this book, um, You Are the Universe, Discovering Your Cosmic Self and Why It Matters. Once again, the questions are drawn from You Are the Universe, Discovering Your Cosmic Self and Why It Matters, a book that I published, co-published, co-authored with Maynas Kofatos, who's a cosmologist and quantum physicist. And today's question <coughs> has, um, has a very interesting uh, idea and it has to do with how much uh, do we control our personal reality and our power of manifestation. So the question that came in is from MC and MC says, why is it that trivial things that we might want to manifest show up easily whereas the goals that we have um, some are, of them are hard to accomplish. Even though we strongly desire them, they do not manifest easily. By goals hard to accomplish, I mean big goals that are hard to accomplish for others as well. For example, if um, you are missing a friend or relative and you want them to um, contact you, it's quite probable that the phone will ring. Even if you're ill, you might use the laws of manifestation and quite probably you will recover. But if you desire a table to move on its own without anything touching it, that won't happen. Similarly, if you want to wake up the next morning in a completely different avatar, let's say a queen, that won't happen. <clears throat> we know who you want to be, MC. Um, but maybe you already are a queen. These are not necessarily big things but are hard to accomplish. If in the quantum world everything is possible, then that means literally everything is possible. Why don't the scenarios I have described occur? There are those theories of parallel universes, so if parallel universes exist, each of these scenarios is already occurring in some parallel universe but it is not being witnessed by the person who desires, desires to manifest such realities here. Okay, <clears throat> pretty interesting question uh, from MC. Let me see, do my best uh, to answer it and I think I'm going to answer it uh, by reading uh, a section from the book. Um, and uh, the, the chapter is called The Power of Personal Reality. Okay, so let me read only the section that uh, is really important here. Although the whole section may benefit you if you have the book. Okay, so let me start um, um, with a simple um, statement. Um, we experience the world through choice. There is no given world. If Newton's apple was anything like the one sold at the supermarket, I'm reading from the book, okay? If um, Newton's apple was anything like the one sold at the supermarket, it was red, sweet, crunchy, slightly grainy in texture and within a certain range of weight. None of these properties exists in nature. They are perceptions of the human mind. I hope you uh, are recognizing that, okay? Red, sweet, crunchy, grainy. These are modifications of consciousness and therefore experience. The apple doesn't need to be reinvented every time you encounter it. Once your perception has decided that apples taste like apples rather than pears or avocados, they stay that way in your mental setup. We've seen earlier in this book that reality is filtered through the brain and its built-in limitations. Um, perhaps uh, you should read up uh, Alfred Korzybski's uh, theory of general semantics. 
which means that uh, how we frame things in our consciousness determines our perception of them. In any case, the brain's imperfection doesn't negate a simple fact. Everything we perceive is a mental creation ac accumulated over millions of years of evolution. It sounds strange to say that we choose for apples to be sweet because that happened long, long ago. Once sweetness became part of our perception, it was expressed physically in our taste buds, which in turn are encoded in our genes. A separate apparatus for liking or disliking sweetness is encoded in our brains. But change is always possible. If you are ill enough with the flu that nothing tastes good, for example, an apple's sweetness can be totally erased by your perceptions. As conscious beings, we still aren't universal perceivers. Our eyes can't see objects in pitch black darkness. If the human brain could detect, uh, detect ultrasound frequencies and infrared light, traits found elsewhere in nature among bats, sharks, reptiles and so on, those abilities would get translated into how our brains function. Yet we can go beyond our limited hardwiring by developing instruments for detecting frequencies of light and sound which our senses leave off. In that sense, we've turned ourselves into potential universal perceivers after all. As choice makers go, we seem to be the champions in nature. There seem to be many things we can't choose to change, such as gravity, the hardness of rocks, and the solidity of a brick wall. Some distinctions need to be made, therefore. Our perception comes in three types three types okay now this is the important part so please listen very carefully there are perceptions that we can't change there are perceptions that we can change and then there are perceptions that sit on the borderline being sometimes changeable and sometimes not in your personal reality all three kinds mix and match if you don't like the color of the shirt you're wearing you can change it that qualifies as a changeable perception if you can't walk through walls, that falls amongst the unchangeable perceptions. What could, one could continue with hundreds of examples from each category. The spice of life comes from the perceptions we change, where the solid security of life comes from the ones we can't change. So remember, the solid security of life comes from perceptions we can't change such as we know that the sun will rise tomorrow, that the earth will continue to spin on its axis, that our blood pressure will keep regulating itself, that our heart will keep spontaneously beating. Those are things we can change ultimately, but the fact is, for the most part, they are relegated to our unconscious mind or even uh, uh, the non-local mind. Once again, therefore, I'll read, the spice of life comes from the perceptions we change, while the solid security of life comes from the ones we can't change. If you could decide not to obey the law of gravity on Mondays, a world of, of chaos would ensue, beginning with your body vanishing in a misty cloud of atoms. But what's truly fascinating is the third category, the perceptions we can sometimes change and sometimes cannot. This is where quantum theory made our participation in nature much more puzzling and more enticing at the same time. It created a shadow zone where particles and people both can make decisions. Being passively present without participating was no longer an option. Every perception is an act of participation in reality. If you perceive another person as the love of your life, your actions will be led into areas of reality unknown before that perception. Every day our actions exist on the cutting edge of evolution, the frontier where the mind is caught between caution and curiosity. The most obvious example is what people have called miracles. Who wouldn't love to believe that a human being once walked on water, that faith can cure disease, that the dead are in communication with all the living? This controversy over miracles isn't in whether they can occur, but in what category they belong. A miracle is only available if it fits into the third category, things that sometimes occur and sometimes don't. 
Of course, you can always practice total exclusion, which is the fixed attitude of atheists and skeptics, or inclusion, which is the fixed attitude of the religiously devout. And if you have no fixed attitude, then you belong in the company of visionary quantum pioneer Wolfgang Pauli, who said, quote unquote, it is my personal opinion that in the science of the future, reality will be neither psychic nor physical, but somehow both and somehow neither. By using a word that science shuns, psychic, Pauli was pointing to a kind of ultimate mystery. The vast physical mechanism we call the universe is on dual control, obeying natural laws and thoughts at the same time. This is the basic reason we pre presently occupy an uncertain universe. But Pauli pointed the way to a solution when he predicted that reality's amalgam of mind and matter would be both and neither at the same time. This sounds like a paradox, so we'll unravel it to reveal why Pauli was simply stating an undeniable truth. I'm not going to continue reading the, the section I hope you can find it, uh, but it's basically um, an understanding of how qualia create our quality, uh, how qualia create our personal reality, and by shifting, uh, <clears throat> by shifting the qualia in our consciousness, we can shift our perceptions of what we call reality. But now go back to MC's question. And imagine that MC, you could shift reality anytime you want. Uh, that would cause a lot of confusion in the world, right? A lot of confusion in the world because we all have our ego identities that want our similar ones. So, you know, you're at a red light and you want the light to turn green and your friend comes along on another road and they want the light to turn green. So whose uh, intention should that light obey? So you see, this is a perfect, perfect setup uh, for us. You can wiggle your toes just by an intention, but um, you can't wiggle my toes by your intention because you have an ego identity that considers itself separate from everything else. There's you and there's everything else. But you are also part of everything and an activity of everything. So when you are perceiving reality from the ego identity, then you ask questions like the ones you asked, like the ones MC asked. But if you shift into an awareness in which you see this body-mind, and all body minds around you, and the painting behind me, and the computer in front of you, and everything else around you is simultaneously co arising and subsiding in an awareness uh, which includes um, both your body mind, my body mind, and all the other body minds that we are in um, having an experience with then shifting that awareness from ego identity to the witnessing awareness in which the ego identity is just another activity actually gives more power to your intentions. And were you to shift totally into pure awareness, then you would recognize that at the most fundamental level, there is uh, only one awareness modifying itself. As I've said, to almost an infinity of uh, knowers, observers, infinity of modes of knowing uh, and observing, an infinity of objects observed, all within the one mind, the cosmic mind, the cosmic self. So that is the only real self, and that self exists in the deep now, where all is happening simultaneously. So here's my suggestion to you, to dear MC and everybody else. Slowly sh start to shift your identity from the separate ego self to the witnessing awareness in which you can observe the separate ego self. 
and then recognizing that witnessing awareness all is happening simultaneously all is simultaneously arising and coincide and and uh, subsiding in that one awareness and that awareness that witnessing uh, awareness uh, is more in the direction of the unified self but ultimately let even the witness fall so the whole universe is um, an expression of your deepest self which is neither personal nor collective but universal and then at that level you will see that all is as it should be that the forces of nature uh, are just the regularities of experience which are species specific as human beings we can quantify them but in the deeper, 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 more universal reality, there's total freedom, infinite possibilities, and yet, in every moment, evolution and entropy and the tension between them dancing as um, the universe all within itself. That's the ultimate level where we can say, Aham Brahmasmi, Aham Brahmasmi, I am the universe, or Tattva Masi, you are that, I am that, all this is that. Okay, so there are things you can shift immediately, things that you cannot shift because they are part of the universal regularities of expression, thank God, and things in between that um, we are astonished by because they break the habits or seem to break the habits of uh, perception. Remember, perception is a learned phenomenon and uh, we learn how to perceive. You know, people are commenting on the painting behind me and some may see it as beautiful and some may see it as confusing, but in the deeper reality, if you see yourself in that painting, then that's beauty. And if you see yourself in me, that's love. And that's all there is. Beauty, love, truth, harmony at the deepest level. And our perception then um, determines the level of conditioning with which we are experiencing the world. Just know that the world is set up as perfectly as uh, it could be. If you were given the choice to change anything. I think the only thing you would want is more peace, more love, more social economic justice, better quality of life for everyone. And also remember that if what you want to manifest is totally for yourself, which means you separate from everything else, that's going to be a little difficult. But if you um, are committed to something bigger than yourself, then everybody will respond to your intention. And so you will have synchronicity and meaningful coincidences and joy. That's what peak experiences are for. That's what self-realization ultimately does. You start to see uh, less separation between you and that which you call the outside world because it's all one activity, number one, so less feeling of separation. Number two, you see that life becomes more effortless and spontaneous as a result of meaningful coincidences and synchronicity. Number three, there is the richness of the present moment in its full sensory and sensual qualities of color, taste, smell, um, just the feeling of effortless spontane spontaneity also gives rise to the richness of experience and the aliveness of experience um, in the present moment. Okay, so that richness of the quality of experience, effortlessness, less separation of self from all that is and a feeling of timelessness in what is called the deep now.
you want to manifest well get rid of the notion of a separate self be part of the wholeness of the universe and realize that in choiceless awareness choiceless awareness the universal mind is spontaneously and effortlessly flowing through you and then that is something we can call flow no resistance in any moment to what is Okay, thank you and I'll see you tomorrow and we'll continue our discussion. Some people joined in late, they were wondering where I was reading from. I was reading from You Are the Universe, Discovering Your Cosmic Self. The discussions are here, uh, discoveringyourcosmicself.com uh, and the chapter I was reading from was um, uh, called the power of personal reality okay thank you and have a wonderful day